UnleashIndependence.com. All right. Thank you for tuning in today. We have a very special broadcast. We have uh, uh, with us uh, the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, Mr. G. Edward Griffin. The topic of discussion is uh, collectivism and then, of course, anything that may lead to the Fed. I don't know how we have a conversation with you and, and not talk or ask ask you about the Fed. Right. Um, but if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little background of yourself and, and maybe let some people that uh, maybe aren't familiar with your work. Uh, well, sure. I'd be glad to do that. It's a, kind of a boring topic, but I guess it's essential. Um, I've been uh, doing uh, independent uh, research and writing for most of my adult life. Uh, I, I published my uh, first book in 1964. Uh, it was um, called The Fearful Master, A Second Look at the United Nations. And I've written on topics that were generally controversial, um, the uh, New World Order, the history of uh, taxation, uh, banking and currency, money issues, all of that sort of thing. I've gotten heavily into uh, alternative health issues as well. Uh, one of my better uh, known books is called World Without Cancer, the story of vitamin B17, which is about an alternative control for cancer that comes from nature. And um, that's what I do. I've uh, usually managed to uh, uh, stay on the controversial side of issues um, because my view, frankly, is that uh, if I'm just uh, talking about things that everybody knows or agrees with, I'm probably just wasting my time. <laughs> so I, I look for areas that I think are important, and I, yet I feel that there needs to be a lot of education on. So basically, I'm a, I'm a writer and a researcher. I write books, and I've produced some documentary films. Very good, very good. Well, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, of your work, and uh, I know Brock is too. Brock, you want to come on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have to say thank you. I mean, your book, Creature from Jekyll Island, um, I, I'm young in my 20s, but uh, your work is kind of what opened uh, my parents' minds um, on the left-right paradigm, uh, just discussing kind of following the money and just the way you wrote your book was so factual, it wasn't an opinion book like most people do, and so just thank you. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, I try hard to uh, uh, to make sure that when I'm expressing my opinions, it's well identified as such, but uh, I usually hold off on those until after I've demonstrated a lot of history upon which those opinions are based. So I've tried very hard to do that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Griffin, could you give us a little bit of uh, an understanding or, or just maybe a definition of collectivism or what collectivism is? Yes, I think that it's important, uh, especially in this current age, for us to be clear on the definitions of uh, what we believe. People have belief structures. They live by them. They direct their lives. Uh, sometimes very important decisions are made on the basis of, of ideology and yet, it's hard for most people to define what they believe and to put a name on it. Most of the words that we use today, I think, are not very clear. They mean different things to different people. You find uh, uh, groups identifying themselves as uh, conservatives. Uh, on the other side, you've got the so-called uh, liberals. You've got left-wingers and right-wingers, Republicans and Democrats and communists and fascists and socialists. And, you know, all of these names are floating around. We have neo-fascists now, neoconservatives, uh, all of these, and progressives. And, you know, all, all of these words are thrown around, and most people have no idea what they mean, except in sort of vague general terms. So quite some time ago, I, I became intrigued by that phenomenon, and I decided, you know, we've got to do something about this. Because I discovered that when people who uh, were debating issues on the basis of those labels, quite often it was the label that was getting in the way. When they got to talking about the nitty-gritties of what they actually believed, they were in agreement. And so once you get rid of those words, uh, it seemed to make uh, it easier to discuss the issue. So having said that, I, I was, have been reading for many, many years uh, uh, ideological dissertations and tomes, you know, the classics all the way down to the modern stuff that you see on the Internet. And I discovered a long time ago that, in, at least in, in the Western world, there are really only two ideological viewpoints, and only two. All the rest of these words are merely variants 
uh, mostly variants of one of them. And those two viewpoints are collectivism on the one side and individualism on the other side. So it's important to know what collectivism is, because if you look at words like communism, socialism, fascism, Nazism, you know, all of these things, they're actually variants of collectivism. They're all very, very similar to each other. In fact, they're identical to each other when it comes to the basic philosophies. So having gone through all of that, uh, individualism is the opposite of collectivism, and so I became rather focused on this issue some time ago, and we've written a lot about it, and you'll find you know, the in-depth analysis of it and the historical uh, evolution of these concepts posted to our website, which is uh, called Freedom Force. It's uh, freedomforceinternational.org. So you find all of this there. But basically, uh, collectivism is, a, is a, a point of view, a philosophy, an ideology probably is the best word for it, that has certain characteristics, uh, certain cherished beliefs included in it. One of them is the idea that the group is more important than the individual. Individualists believe that the individual is more important than the group. Uh, on all of these issues, individualists are the opposite of collectivists. But the collectivists believe that uh, the group is more important and that individuals must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. Now, I was taught that in school. I was, and when I went to the University of Michigan, that was an idea that was taught, and it was not taught to be questioned. It was just taught as the, the obvious ideal, you know, and we all accepted it. I did. I thought it was a great idea, the greater good of the greater number. How could you argue with that? You know, democracy, isn't that the basis of democracy? Majority rule and all of those sorts of things. Um, individualists don't believe that, and it, you may wonder... A lot of people, how could you challenge that concept? Well, you can challenge it because it's based on a false assumption. The assumption is that the group exists. In reality, there is no such thing as a group. Group is not a thing, it's a word. It's an abstraction in the mind. It's a mathematical concept. You can't touch a group. You can't see a group. A group doesn't exist. You can touch a person. You can see a person, but group is this abstraction for the concept of more than one person. It's all based on the concept of person. It's a mathematical abstraction. And it's the same thing with the word like forest. There's no such thing as a forest. There are only trees. You can't see a forest. You can't touch a forest. But you can touch trees and you can see trees. And so uh, it, it follows through in a lot of things in life. And so when we say that the group is more important than the individual, and the group doesn't even exist. We've made a terrible mistake because now we're saying that something that doesn't exist, you know, has rights and has. Uh, it's more important than individuals which do exist. And all of a sudden, you're on that slippery slope where you come to the point where in, individuals, some individuals, say that they speak on behalf of the group. Ah, now it's like that Orwellian concept, you know. Uh, all, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Well, when individuals start speaking on behalf of the group, now those individuals who are real become more important than other individuals, more equal. And all of the totalitarian systems of the modern age are based on this erroneous assumption that there is such a thing as a group and that the individuals must be sacrificed for it. And so you always have leaders now. You say, I represent the group. I am the leader of the group. And we shall decide what is best for society, what is best for the majority, you know. And so anyway, that's one of the important concepts uh, or the distinctions between collectivism and individualism. We could go on with others, but, you know, this isn't the place for it. I would urge anybody interested in this very important and, I think, fascinating topic is to come to freedomforceinternational.org and look up this thing. It will be found on the issues section. And uh, I, I think it's going to be quite an eye-opener for those who are inclined to ideological thoughts of this kind. Yeah, no, very good. And we'll, we'll uh, go ahead and post that link underneath the... Uh, our videos and, and where we have uh, have this available for our listeners, so that they can find you. Um, and this information, it's it's really eye opening what you uh, bring up um, because I, I think a lot of the times people do, uh, you know, they they play hypotheticals where, well, you know, wouldn't it be better to 
uh, you know, uh, you know, act this way against one individual to save to save the you know all of them or all the people and, and things like that. I, I really appreciate your insight to that. So thank you very much. Yes, it's it's a it's a common thought, and we cover all of those uh, those assumptions and those uh, uh, those fallacious. Uh, chunks of reasoning there. Where do these rights come from to take a life of another person? You know, uh, and, and is it a mathematical source? Do, do two people have the right to take the life of a third person because there are two of them <laughs> against one, or does it come from something more fundamental than that, which is that any one of them could take the life of another person under some circumstances? And of course, that's the answer. What are those circumstances? Those circumstances would be in a defensive mode. You have a right to take the life of another person if it's necessary to defend your own life, to protect your own life, your own life, liberty, and your property. A negative, the, the proper use of coercion or force is only justified when it's negative and when it's defensive, but never aggressive, you know. So this is how we start off, and you have to get down to some basics, and once, once you get to them, they're not that difficult. And boy, it's an eye opener for most. It certainly was for me when I realized that probably about 99% of all of the laws that we have around the world are based on this collectivist assumption that the individual must be sacrificed for the greater good of the greater number. And it's no wonder mm. the world is as sick as it is. I say that, uh, that's just amazing. And I first heard that uh, from you. Actually, I it just changed my viewpoint of everything. I mean. I, already, I thought I understood liberty, but you put it in such simple terms, so that's amazing. Um, one question I had for you, though, was uh, in, it seems like in, in some of the old books uh, from like the early 1900s or even in the 1930s and 40s, people were using the term collectivism and individualism, but nowadays it seems to be no one that uses it. it, it where did, what, why did, what, I guess what caused that to change? Well, one could be a little jaundiced in there after that. I don't know really why, but I suspect it's because if you use words like that, uh, you have to understand what they mean. Uh, they don't come with all of this garbage attached to them like words, other words do, like socialism, communism, Nazism. Uh, you, have to, you can't just respond to them emotionally. You have to say, well, what is collectivism? What is individualism? You know, in the political arena today, uh, our leaders, I'm, I'm afraid, I hate to say this, but I know it's true, they really don't want us thinking too much. <laughs> they really don't. They want us to respond emotionally. You know, they want us to say, yeah, yeah, this is right and this is wrong, but we don't know why. But we like this person. He's sincere. He'll do the right thing. You know, it's the idea that the guy, the man on the white horse, let's follow him. We're not sure where he's going, but he's got a white horse. So it's that kind of a mentality they really like. Because if people don't ask questions and they don't have principles, uh, they're a lot easier to lead. When you've got your principles clearly in mind, you start asking questions, then politicians have a rougher time because most of them are merely con artists. No. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I kind of want to transition a little bit because I don't have you, or we don't have you for that much more time, but I do want to ask if you are familiar with um, this new sentiment kind of coming out that's, uh, about it's called uh, ignore the Fed, and uh, with your work with uh, the creature from Jekyll Island and everything else that you have done, um, I wanted to get your opinion. Uh, there's a video floating around YouTube. Um, this this gentleman, I think his name's Brad Gray. Um, is that correct, Brock? I think it's uh, Rob Gray actually. But... Oh, Rob, Rob Gray uh, from OpenCurrency.com, and he is. Um, He's talking to Congress and uh, or in, in some sort of forum, and basically he he asks that people or that the Congress do not pass any any sort of uh, sound money legislation. He says that uh, it's wolf and it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, and the best thing to do is to ignore the Fed because it's not a viable option. It will it will collapse. It will uh, not be able to be sustained, and uh, the market will not wait for them uh, and we'll move on and we'll find better options and that's what they're already doing. I wanted to just get your your opinion on that or if you have a comment to, towards that. Well, I, I probably should be very cautious about coming on, uh, commenting on that until I know more about it, but based on what you have said, it sounds to me like it's kind of a, uh, a shallow argument. In other words, it has some truth to it, but I, there, it has some elements that don't sound right to me. Um, 
it is true that the Fed is not viable. There's no question about that. It's got to collapse. But it's not true uh, that you can ignore it because it has the power of law behind it. And even though the money system collapses down to zero, we have such things as uh, legal tender laws, which require the American people to accept this worthless stuff. And when everything collapses uh, and, and you want to use your alternative currency, they'll simply say, no, you can't do that. Uh, that's counterfeit. You must use this uh, Federal Reserve note by law. You say, so you can't ignore it. It's, uh, it, it, it's, the, uh, the white, it's the bull in the china shop. You can't ignore it. You've got to deal with it, I think. Although I would praise anybody that's talking about an alternative currency because I think we do have to uh, restore this country to a sound currency based on gold or silver. But I don't, I'm not too happy about the concept of ignoring uh, the Fed because they have the power of law behind them. Sure, sure, Absolutely. You bring up a good point uh, on that. I, I, I have a question. Uh, this is actually it was submitted to us um, from. Well, we have we have a couple that I wanted to get to, but this one is from Julie, and uh, Julie wanted to know if you think that there's a certain uh, certain type of upbringing that can encourage independent thinking um, for for a child, and if you could elaborate on that. Well, I have to think a little bit about that because I'm sure that upbringing has a lot to do with how a child develops. There's no question about that. But on the other hand, I think most people, in spite of their upbringing, have a certain capacity for for intellectual thought. Now, maybe they don't develop it. Maybe they're not encouraged to develop it. Uh, and certainly the school systems today, it doesn't doesn't encourage people to develop this independence of thought. We go through school and our grades are dependent pretty much on the on uh, the degree to which we just accept what's being taught to us. I, I, know, uh, I know even when I was going through school, which is way before this became really intense, even then there was a certain pressure that, uh, well, don't ask too many questions, don't make waves, just remember what the teacher told you, what the textbook said, and, and regurgitate it back. And if you do that without questioning, you get a good grade. Uh, but anyway, I, I really think that uh, it's true that the way you're brought up, it makes a lot of difference. But still, I have hope that for most people, when they, suddenly, when they suddenly realize that they're living in kind of a fantasy world and that much, if not most, of what they've been told uh, about authority is wrong and that the authority that's, there, that's out there is not really interested in, in their best interest but in the best interest of the authority structure, once they get that clearly in mind, I, I like to think at least that most people will break that eggshell that's been put around their brain by their upbringing and say, wait a minute, it's time for me to start thinking independently. So I guess to answer your question, I would say yes and no on that. Uh, let's hope, let's hope that, the, that most people have the ability to, to break that mold. <laughs> no, great. I've got a question also. Um, this is from Zach. Um, he wanted to know, does the Fed have a, a 100-year charter? Um, uh, there's rumors floating around that they're, they had a charter originally, and so it's about to expire, but uh, that's the only thing I've heard is it a rumor. Can you shed some light on that? Well, it's, it's another one of those yes and no things. <laughs> I hate those, but they're all over the place. Um, originally, the, the Fed did have an expiration date. Uh, but a long time ago, they changed that. You see, the Fed has been amended. The uh, charter has been amended over 100 times since it was passed originally in 1913. And one of the things they got rid of was that expiration date. Uh, so now the expiration of the Federal Reserve is, uh, the word they use is indefinite. So in other words, it's, it's renewed automatically, indefinitely, uh, which means it will never be automatically uh, rescinded. But that doesn't mean Congress still can't abolish it. They can. But it won't happen because of a pre-programmed date. Gotcha. All right. And uh, final question I have, uh, this is from Christine. And Christine asks, um, in all the histories or scriptures that I have read, the majority has always failed and entire civilizations have been destroyed. According to scripture, God has only uh, made promises to the remnant the few or the little flock, whatever it may be called, why do you believe that the masses never learn? Is it because we believe it will never happen to us? Well, it brings up a really important uh, subject, and that is the role of the majority or the role of the masses. Uh, 
the, the unfortunate truth is, uh, the surprising truth is, that throughout history, the majority of the people have never made much of a difference. They've always been followers. The, uh, the real movers and shakers of society that make things happen have always been a small number. Every society that's ever risen, every civilization that's ever been uh, built that's worth anything has been built by a relatively small number of people in the lead. And it's certainly true of the American Republic. It's true of Western civilization. It's, it's true of all civilizations. So the idea that we have to get 51% or a higher number of the people to understand and to take the lead in something is, a, is based on a, a false model. Uh, the remnant, the uh, the elite, the small numbers are always the ones that you have to be concerned with. And in a way that's uh, encouraging because a lot of us will say, golly, the guy next door, he just doesn't get it. I talk to people and they don't seem to care, you know. And it's as though it makes any difference that the majority cares because it doesn't. The fortunate thing is that all we need to do is reach that 3% or approximately, maybe not even that, of people who do care, who do understand, who do have the gumption to get up off their couches and to, and to assume leadership positions in society, to, to take an active role in the organizations out there, the political parties, the church organizations, the, the labor unions, to become active in, in media outlets, uh, even uh, to to uh, undertake a, a, a radio talk show, or whatever it takes, some people will always be uh, in the forefront in a leadership capacity. So yes, it's true that uh, uh, that the majority is, uh, is is going to be very laconic and they're going to follow. But instead of being upset by that, I think we should recognize it as a as an opportunity and a, and a very good sign that the three percent to which we like to think we belong, we can actually make a huge difference in the future of the world. Awesome. Great. Well, one, one last question. This is by uh, David Miller and comment. He said that his efforts in pursuit of truth have raised awareness across the board. He said my question for him would be what should states and counties and cities and families do to protect themselves from this fiscal disaster? Well, there are certain definite things that can be done, and I think most people are probably tired of hearing about them, that could be done to protect yourself and your family from fiscal disaster. But that's not the whole picture, because the fiscal disaster, as important as it is, is outranked by another disaster, which is a, a, a lack of freedom, the destruction of society. And the unfortunate fact is that when the fiscal system collapses, if it does, if the economy collapses, the monetary system collapses, what usually happens, and I'm afraid will happen again, is that people will find themselves in bondage to the state because they'll turn to the state to save them when they're hungry, when, they, when they're sick. They want the government to, to provide them with food and shelter and education and health care and you know, pay the mortgage to to, have, to pay for their insurance to to you know tell them what to do and where to go and how to live. Once it reaches that stage, then the economy or, or fiscal security doesn't seem much important anymore. But the so with that eye um, on that long view that we must restore the system and think about that. Uh, the answer to the first part is easy. The, to protect yourself from fiscal chaos is pretty easy. All you have to do is get whatever uh, savings you have out of money because money, uh, at least as we know it today, like Federal Reserve notes, national currencies are all fiat currencies. They're not backed by anything. They have no intrinsic value. They only have political value. Uh, they only, the only value they have is because you're forced by law to accept them, and that does give them some value. But as they keep making so many of those dollars and dollars, each one gets less and less valuable and you can buy less and less with it. So the answer to the question though is to the extent that it's possible get whatever savings and whatever wealth you have out of uh, national currencies and put it somewhere into something that has intrinsic value. For the, for the average person the easiest answer to that question is gold or silver. Bearing in mind that when the system if the system collapses the government can still say, well, it's illegal for you to own gold and silver. They'll come and take it away from you. That's why I say that the fiscal question is not necessarily the only question here. 
But other things, if you have a business, it would be possible to put whatever assets you have into excess inventories. If you were uh, had a tire business, for example, maybe you'd, you'd instead of having a one year supply of tires, you'd go to two or three or four years of, of tires. Anything that's not um, uh, that's m not money, anything that has intrinsic value, would be the best way, in my opinion at least, to avoid the fiscal chaos that's coming in the event of the collapse of the total collapse of the national currency. Wonderful. Well, so thank you, uh, Mr. Griffin, G. Edward Griffin. Um, again, you can find his uh, his work. His website is freedomforceinternational.org, and uh, we'll have that link down below. Uh, please share this. Get get out this information that he's provided and work very hard to produce. And, and uh, yeah, we, again, thank you so much for coming on. And great, great information. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, gentlemen, thanks for inviting me. Independence is the foundation. This doesn't mean you are alone. With our online community, you are able to exchange information with people who share your same desire and respect for self-reliance. Thank you for being a part of Unleashing Independence, the place where complaints are curved and solutions are obtained. You can control your life rather than have life control you. UnleashIndependence.com UnleashIndependence.com